Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. My name is Kate Rademacher, and this is the second Tuesdays uh, Writers Discussion Group with Writing for Your Life. We are recording this session, so we'll put it online afterward, and really, really delighted to have Molly Basquette here. She is the author of several books that I love, including her most recent, How to Begin When Your World is Ending. Um, I've asked Molly to uh, tell us a little bit about herself to get us started. But before we do that, just want to, um, again, welcome everyone who's here and invite people who are here in person to introduce in yourself in the chat, including where you're calling in from. Um, and so what we're going to do just in terms of logistics is uh, on these second Tuesdays, we typically ask the speaker to share about 20, 25 minutes worth of comments, and then we'll open it up for Q&A and discussion. So please be saving your questions. Um, when we have the open discussion time. Um, so again, Molly is a, is, a, is a pastor and a writer, and I'll ask her to introduce, um, you know, to tell us more about her background. But just really, Molly, thank you so much for being here. I love your writing. I love your new book. And really thrilled you're going to be talking to us about memoir, including the ethical memoir and how we can, you know, write memoir without burning the whole thing down. I love that subtitle. So um, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Sure thing. And thanks, Kate, for having me in. And thanks, everyone, for spending time with me tonight or today, wherever you are. I'm in Berkeley, California, um, where I am the pastor of First Congregational Church of Berkeley, United Church of Christ. I am a transplanted East Coaster. I was born and bred primarily in Boston, Massachusetts, but also Hartford, Connecticut. Um, spent some time overseas here and there. I have been a pastor for pretty much my whole adult life. I was just telling Kate, I'm 52 and I've been a student minister or a, a minister for 30 years, which feels like a really long time to be doing anything. Um, and the last thing I wanna say about my bio, I also became an author along the way, you know, pastors write for a living. Um, and sometimes we're lucky enough to reach wider audiences. I write the for- The odds were against me. <laughs> there's someone who's right, a really sweet child some, in their room. Yeah, some background noise. Maybe folks can mute if you're not speaking and I'll, I'll try to mute folks as well. Go ahead, and you may, my youngest child is 16, but you may hear my one-year-old dog in the background. So apologies, she's in training, but very excited a lot of the time. So my son has her and hopefully she'll be quiet. Um, yeah, I live here in Berkeley, California, or actually Alameda, um, a cute little island in the Bay off Oakland, California with my husband and my two young adult children, um, 16 and 21, and our new one-year-old rescue. Um, and yeah write books, um, really got into publishing more through the UCC Daily Devotionals, which is um, a free daily devotional that my denomination publishes. There's about 15 regular writers for it. We do print, print materials and also emailed devotionals every day. Um, and my first book actually began as a very long FAQ for the church that I was serving in Somerville, Massachusetts in greater Boston. Um, we had a lot of success turning our scrappy little church that had been declining in numbers um, for many, many years around. Um, it was a team effort. And this was, you know, from 2002 through, I was there 2002 through 2016. And a lot of people wanted to know how we did what we did and wanted to take me out to coffee and asked me how we did that. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll write it all up and send you the PDF. And my denomination turned that into um, a book called Real Good Church, How Our Church Came Back from the Dead and Yours Can Too. Um, and so since then, I've just been writing the books primarily that I needed. You know, writing is one way I kind of surfaced my own feelings and wisdom and kind of reverse engineer solutions or or I, I like to say I don't have a lot of my own wisdom, but I'm a magpie. I'm really good at gathering things from other people, which is what my new book is, is about a lot. Um, I'm a big reader. I think um, most of us who are writers really are, 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 are great readers because we love words and we um, it's part of our 10,000 hours. You know, how we master something is by reading, being really careful and, and loving and enthusiastic readers. Um, so other books I've written were a book about parenting, um, purporting myself to be a parenting expert while I was struggling with my own children um, that I co-wrote with a 
child psychologist friend. Um, it's at the nexus of um, child psychology, the best of child development and spirituality. I've written a couple grief workbooks for kids. I've written a book about how fun it is to uh, confess our, our sins in public, in public testimony in church. Um, I think that's it. Is that six books? Anyhow, a little bit about the origin story of this book, um, which Kate showed you. The subtitle is A Spiritual Field Guide to Joy Despite Everything. Um, I am a cancer survivor. I was 39 years old when by complete accident, uh, they found a very aggressive cancer growing in my lung. I was asymptomatic. I might've died if a kind of mystical thing hadn't happened to find the tumor early enough to excise it and treat the rest of my body for errant cancer cells. My children were really young. It was, as you can imagine, pretty harrowing and really put my faith to the test. Um, you know, these things I'd been preaching and offering in pastoral care to people for years, I finally got to decide if they were true for myself. You know, is God good all the time? Something we said in my church every week. Um, who is, you know, who is to blame when someone gets cancer? Um, how do we come to terms with our mortality, especially when it seems to be hurtling toward us um, far be, far long before our time, you know, when we're still really in the midst of living, raising young, young humans, um, and really craving so much more out of life. Um, so through cancer treatment, I kept a blog. Um, it was my way, again, of kind of surfacing, processing, finding meaning to what I was going in, but also protecting my church um, from all the gory details. They could, of course, read the blog if they wanted to, my parishioners, but they didn't have to if they kind of wanted a little bit of a veil up or a little bit of a boundary up. Um, I always knew I would probably turn that into a book just because how many people get cancer every year? How many people care for someone with cancer? Um, and so I originally wrote the book as kind of a straight memoir. And my very kind, very honest literary agent said, this isn't a book, it's a blog dump, <laughs> and send me back to the drawing board. Um, from there, I really went into, um, I kind of took the lens back a lot more and said, okay, this really isn't just about cancer. It's about how we face, it's about how we, what what a what a good and durable spirituality is in the face of all the hard things that happen to us in life. And at this point, I'd accompanied so many people through hard things and seen them rise from their own ashes wondrously, gorgeously, that I really wanted to tell their stories too. Um, and so that the the book became, you know, the cancer is a through line, my cancer story, sort of beginning, middle, end. I got to live, hooray, happy ending. Um, but it's really about so many other things. And here's where I wanna go back and say, yeah. I, I didn't always mean to be a pastor. I've always been a church kid and a church camp kid. And, and those places and people have been so important to me um, and made me who I am. But when I was, you know, 16, I wanted to be a famous author. Actually, I wanted to be a famous journalist and I wanted to write for Vanity Fair and go to awesome cocktail parties in New York City and Hobnob. Um, and I actually worked in journalism through college and then even through seminary, I was still kidding myself at that point. I was like, if this ministry thing doesn't work out, I can always be a journalist. Um, I mostly at, in college, I wrote for the daily paper and I started a feminist newspaper in grad school. I worked for, um, the news and arts weekly, the little like local free news and arts, arts weekly. And it was great fun. Um, but one thing became really clear to me in the process of being a journalist, and that's that I really loved people's stories and I fell in love with them as I was telling their stories. And then after it was published and it was like literally yesterday's news, I had to drop those people. And that really hurt them because they thought I was their friend. And it also hurt me, but I also like couldn't keep accumulating people without some boundaries. So that was actually like summer after college ended was the trigger for me to understand I'm not supposed to be a journalist. I'm supposed to be a pastor because pastors collect people's stories, but then stay with them. They mirror those stories back to them in sacred ways and give them holy perspective on even the hardest things that have happened. So that's kind of 
deep background for the whole book. Um, a little bit more of the nuts and bolts of of put, writing a memoir and really a memoir that's not just my story but a lot of other people's stories. Um, as a preacher, you know, um, I do a lot of storytelling in my sermons, particularly about my kids, particularly when they are were a lot cuter than they are now and said the darndest things when they were really young. Um, obviously, not when they were two, but by the time they were like four, I would always ask their permission to tell their story um, because. I've heard that confident, a good definition for confidentiality is the right to tell your own story unless someone else gives you permission to tell that story. And I wanted them to have that sense of agency and autonomy and control over their own story, which felt really important. And not to make them the butt of my joke or a cautionary tale or anything like that. And I did not want to humiliate them ever in the course of telling their stories. Same with my spouse, um, same with my parishioners, because I often do tell stories about them and for the most part, people were really generous and they'd say, yeah, yeah, sure. And they would feel pretty good about how things turned out, you know, after they heard the sermon, they're like, oh, blush, like, oh, the load me. Um, but, you know, for the most part, the response was yes. It was a little trickier when it was time to write a book because, you know, a sermon is like a sand painting, right? It's like there and it's gone. Even though the internet is forever, no one thinks like, oh, that's the sermon that's gonna break the internet. And like, you know, my mother-in-law back home is gonna hear what happened to me, right? Um, so that felt like a big step up for people as far as giving permission. Um, and knowing that that, was gonna come into play at some point, I really didn't want to start to self-censor before I got the story out. So what I did was like went into my hidey hole, wrote the book that I really wanted to write, wrote the, the shitty first draft per Anne Lamott, wrote the better second draft, sent that to my editor, because if she was gonna say, this has to go, this has to go, cut a lot of the fat here, I didn't wanna like risk those relationships and then have the story not even appear in the book. So I was pretty far through the process before I went back to people. Um, it was about a year before publication, the, the draft was in, and it, I took about a month to go through at least 40 or 50 people. Like even if I just had like a little throwaway line, I went back to them. In some cases, people I hadn't talked to in 20 years or longer. Um, two of the most significant people were people in the first church I served. One had, I, they were both people I'd visited in prison. Um, one was already in prison when I became the associate pastor of that church. She was in prison at, because she'd had a psychotic break from an undiagnosed mental illness and killed her daughter and tried to kill herself and was in prison for murder. Um, she had a surviving daughter who she'd also tried to kill, who also came into my life in a really beautiful way. The second person was someone who went to prison um, while I was there, while I was his pastor, for child sexual abuse, like one of the worst imaginable things. And what that did to our church and what that did to him and his marriage and family relationships, but how he came to terms with it, how he acknowledged how he tried to engage in restorative justice, how he tried to heal himself so he would not reoffend were really, really significant. So it was a really significant story that needed to be told. So I basically had to call up these two people I hadn't talked to in 15 years and say, um, hi, you guys, can I tell the world the worst thing you've ever done <laughs> for my book? Um, and they were tremendously gracious about it. I think um, partly because they were so spiritually mature, they'd become so mature because of what had happened to them. They'd done the real work. Um, and they knew that I wasn't going to tell their stories as hero stories, nor as villain stories, because we're all heroes and villains. We're all good and bad all mixed together. Everyone, no matter what you've done or like whether you've gone to prison for child sex abuse or murdering your daughter or not, like we all have stuff we got to reckon with. None of us is the hero. Um, there were people who absolutely under no condition wanted me to tell their story. Um, they just wanted to be excised from the book. One was a former parishioner who was like 
really offended that I even had put it put pen to paper with her name in it, even though the only person who'd read it was my editor, who, you know, would was sworn to confidentiality. Um, and that was a real awakening for me. You know, she um, she's a young queer person um, who grew up in a fundamentalist church. And I won't get into all the details, but essentially like her church put a lot of really heavy expectations on her. Her father had died of cancer and she was considered like a healing presence. And when he died anyhow, it made, you know, it sort of like blew up the church because it's like if she had just had enough faith and if her healing hands had worked well, he wouldn't, he could, he wouldn't have died. And there's all her like coming out layered through that. And she just felt like I robbed her story, like taken her story away from her that only she had the right to tell. So I had to make some amends for that. Um, one of my sisters who has had two psychiatric hospitalizations did not want to be in the book. She's not ashamed of it. She works in, um, she works in behavioral health for a living, public health, public behavioral health. She's an amazing human. She wants to destigmatize mental health, but she's mid career and she doesn't know what future employers are going to see, you know, and how that's going to bias them toward her. So, um, had 50 or 60 conversations, showed people the actual words I'd written about them, gave them all a chance to amend, elide, anonymize themselves, um, or just take themselves out of the story altogether. Um, one person who at the last second, she was a really significant story, like right in the first chapter, we were about to go to press, said, I'm out. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm her pastor now. It was the right thing to do, but it hurt so much. <laughs> like, it was like cutting a big, gaping, jagged hole in my book. It's fine. You know, I found another story that works great from another prisoner who was really ready and willing. Um, this person was also a trauma survivor, horrific sexual and religious abuse. And you know, I've just learned, and I was reading a lot more about trauma as I was writing the book. Um, I learned a lot more about the need trauma survivors have to control the narrative. Um, and I just needed to respect that, like as a pastor and as a person. Um, okay, I'm going to scoot over to my notes and see what I'm forgetting here. Oh, okay. The, I also wrote about my current church um, here in Berkeley, as I said, I've been here for seven years. The church burned down on my five month anniversary. A lot of other things happened in that same period, including two of my sisters having suicide attempts, both my children getting clinically depressed from the move and the dislocation, lots of other stuff. And there was a big conflict at church. Oh, and my brother was murdered. And there was a big conflict at church that was brewing. And the Sunday after my brother was murdered overseas, extrajudicially in a Philippine prison, which I know sounds like a Netflix show and not like someone's real life, but I assure you it's true and as awful as it sounds. Um, a couple old guys, no, no offense to any old guys in the room, stood up and said, basically like said, I have no um, I have no confidence in our senior minister's leadership, but I'm pulling my pledge. And the rest of the congregation in the meeting was absolutely silent. And I was devastated, like crushed. Like I am already this big gaping wound and they're threatening my employment. And it didn't matter that like, they're the bullies and everyone knows they're cranky and I probably wasn't gonna get fired, but like that no one came to my defense really, really hurt. And this is in the second to last chapter called Church on Fire, when like lot, when lots of stuff comes at you at once and how we work through it. And I will tell you that, you know, at first I was like, do I really want to tell this story? Because I'd like to stay employed. Um, and then the first draft was really me getting my feelings out and me making the chief bully the bad guy and actually revealing more about him than ethically I probably had a right to because there are some things that I knew in confidence but that the congregation at large didn't know that helped me to understand. Like I knew why he was targeting me. Um, but I, and so I wrote that into the first draft and I was like, I can't, ethically I can't, right? Like I took a pastoral vow of confidentiality. So 
I went back to it. I sent it to about 10 people in my church who I really trust, mature people. And I said, um, whether you were in that meeting or not, can you give me an honest take about this? And they weren't defensive. They didn't try to protect the church's reputation. They just said, like, they gave me some different, more nuanced perspectives. And I went back, excuse me, I went back and I rewrote it a few times with the lens not on like, you know, Molly, the justice warrior, and she was so wrong, but like, what was my work that I failed to do at the time? And I had done some training in family systems since then, some pretty intensive training. If there's any clergy in the room, I really recommend it. It's called um, Clergy Clinic through the Lombard Mennonite Peace Center. It's in the book. Um, that helped me acknowledge like, what the heck was I doing in a meeting I knew was going to be a fight five days after my brother died? Like, right? What in me would not allow the visioning of the church to proceed if I wasn't there? Like, did I trust them or not? Did I trust that God was present in that room and God would do what God wanted <laughs> with this church, which is God's church, not my church? So that's a thumbnail of that. And um, I'm, I'm happy to report that when the book came out, I was like, they're going to read it. Oh, no. Uh, they had a big launch party for me. I'm like, OK, what's going to happen when they get to chapter 15? And a number of people came to me and said, I had no idea you were so hurt at the time. I was checked out or I didn't understand. And I'm really sorry I let that go by without supporting you. So that meant a lot. And only one person, and this is very mild, she's married to one of the milder bullies, came to me before church one day and she said, I finished your book last night and I'm so glad everything turned out all right. And I said, um, turned out all right, meaning I got to survive cancer. And she said, well, no, I meant turned out all right that the church, um, what did she say? Basically like that the church came out smelling okay <laughs> she, she had a more genteel way of saying that but i was like oh you're glad i didn't publicly shame us um so you can see where i'm kind of and i know my time's almost up i want to open it up to the whole group to talk about any of these issues you know being the hero of your own story how, how not to be the hero, how to how to make your story like an every person's story um how to decide what to include and what not to include but hopefully you can see where i tried to like find this ethical, you know, sort of find this ethical, like middle ground where I was really telling the truth as much as I could, because not to do so would not simply not be that impactful, right? If there's, if there's no tension, if there's no, if there's no revelation of our sin, for lack of a better word, our frailty, our failings. Um, if everyone's a hero, like there's nothing there, um, but without robbing people of their dignity or their voice. Um, quick to see if there's anything else I wanted to say. Oh, the last, last thing. Um, talking about your kids when they're, you know, 15 and 19, that's how they were when I was writing the book is different from like sermon illustrations when they're four and eight. Um, Teenagers are much more private and our family's been through some big stuff. As I mentioned, mental health stuff. Our son um, has ADD, ADD and um, at the time was really struggling with substances, marijuana, cannabis in particular. Um, and that felt like a really part of a important part of the story to tell because it was my story too. Um, and I'm really grateful they both gave me permission and sitting down with them on the sofa and reading their pages together before we went to press was some of the most like transformative um, conversations I've had with my kids. I learned so much more about our son and his perspective on everything that had happened to him and it made the book better and it made our relationship better. So like, don't shy away from the hard stuff, go at it, but be careful how you, you know, be really respectful and expansive about how you enter those conversations and be willing to let your perspective go and let kill your little darlings for the sake of making the book actually truer. So I've been talking without a breath for 20 minutes. 
thoughts and some what's on your minds Wow. Well, thank you so much, Molly. What a powerful story and really what an ambitious project. I mean, what you tried to do of weaving in your own story plus parishioners plus family is really an ambitious project. Um, <clears throat> so I'll kick us off just with a very practical question. And, and then please, others, you can type in the chat or raise your hand, ideally, if you if you want to come off mute. And I did mute some folks because we were having some background noise, so you may need to unmute yourself. Um, but Molly, just on a practical level, I know sometimes authors get releases, written releases. Um, did you end up doing that with any of your folks? All um, of them. They... All okay. of them. I would have done it anyhow, but my editor insisted, and I'm glad she did. And that protects you from libel and other stuff. Wow. So again, what a, I mean, just on a, pra again, on a practical level, this just seems like a huge time project. I mean, books are always yeah. a lot of work, but this seems like it, I mean, to have, what did you say, 50 conversations? I mean, do you feel, again, as a, as a published author, I know that the, <laughs> there's not a lot of money in book writing. And so I'm just curious, like, do you feel like that was soul work? Was it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Work? yeah, it was soul work. You know, we just did our taxes and I was like, you know, I think, I think my book did okay. Like, I'm not a New York Times bestseller, you know, like a lot of us are just sort of what's the word like journeyman authors and we're never going to like it's ne never going to be our primary income. But then when I saw like how much I actually like netted, I was like, oh, <laughs> um, totally. It was so work, you know, it, it's I, I'm a big fan of Henry Nowen, anyone who's read anything he's ever written about the concept of the wounded healer putting our wounds into the service of others for me it was that kind of a labor of love like putting my own wounds into the service of others and putting other people's wounds into the service of others and i think you know for the two people in prison for everyone really who got excited about the project and said yes like they they got it they got that that's what they were doing, that it really wasn't about them, it was about their story being a lens on what would be possible for everyone who read this book, you know, to give them solace, to give them like a little, to shine the light a little ahead of them on the journey so they could take the next step and not feel so alone and in the dark, whether it was leaving an abusive marriage, there's a story about that, or um, I'm blank, you know, fighting, like experiencing racism in a in a really like hateful violent way this incredible man in my neighborhood um yeah. whatever it is just like give them room a little more room to breathe a mentor a guide uh you know someone a standard bearer to like shine the light down the way so that's what motivated me and it was like never in question that like this is this is this is soul work Great, thank you. Well, Susan has her hand up and then there's a question in the chat. So I'll, let's go to Susan first. Um, I, I'm a retired United Methodist minister and plan to write my own memoir also. Um, my question goes along these lines. From what you've said, I, um, my question is that you identified by name people in your book when you told their stories. Yes. Because, um, and some of the stories that I know that I will use, I absolutely do not plan on identifying people by name, nor do I plan on, um, the stories will still be true and significant and will not lose their importance or their criticality. However, I think some of them will be as such that <laughs> they've probably happened in all churches, quite frankly. Yeah. So yeah. that was, so my question is, when you were talking about um, the ethicality of it, I understand that. I understand the confidentiality of it also. And yet, um, from the time I really conceived that this book might happen, I never really thought that I would use people's names or that it would be that, you know, they might, yeah, that's me, but circumstances might say, yeah, it's you, but it's not your name. And there are other things that are changed. It's not, it could be others too. Yeah. So what's the reaction? 
I thought about this a lot through the process because there were there were people. Um, some people's names are real. Most people's names are real in my book. Some people wanted pseudonyms, which is fine, or wanted to be further anonymized. Um, some there are a few composite characters. The, the thing I didn't want to get into, the sticky wicket I didn't want to get into was like, what if I made all these composite characters and didn't tell the original people that like, oh, you're like part of this person, or or maybe they weren't part of that person at all, but they'd be like, you wrote about me. You know, I wanted to get out ahead of that and like deal with the feelings up front before it went to press rather than have people read it like oh it's a tell-all memoir and am i in it and did she say what she say about me and is that me in disguise so um i also think you know for me names are really names are great signifiers right like and they and they're very specific and what makes stories compelling is detail and specificity it's like if you're too vague then yeah. the reader just gets a little lost Mm -hmm. Okay, I agree with that too. And thank you. Sure. Thanks. And Jenny, I think you had a similar question. Did that address it or do you want to add to it? Yeah, I might add a little bit. Um, I agree. I, I, I wrote a book and it had a lot of patient stories in it, which were totally fictionalized and a lot were, a number were composite. Um, but then it also had some memoir in it. And um, I absolutely didn't identify any of my family members by name and was fairly vague about, it was very detailed about how I felt and reacted to certain very traumatic situations, but um, I didn't identify the perpetrator. And that was important to safeguard my own family um and people could guess but it would be a guess and in terms of other things that happened in my church which were pretty sticky it was interesting my editor actually said not to label the actual situation which was around lgbtq things like it so often is because it just polarizes the reader and they they go to one side or another and they get lost in the issue instead of the story, which is how it got handled. And I wanted people to really go into how things got handled and not into the, the topic. So when possible, instead of using, I, I use very few names and I absolutely got permission from everybody, written permission. And when the editor thought things were too specific, they they made it they made me change it because they didn't there were some where they were worried were, about libel yeah there's some bad deeds done and they didn't you know necessarily yeah. want those people to get upset but um i don't know it, it was an interesting process but it i in memoir of like what part is your story to tell like you said i think that's important it's all your story and the other part I wrestle with is and why I ultimately included the conflict story in the book and some others, the church conflict story and some others is like daylight is a great disinfectant. One way people change is by, you know, when you make things socially unacceptable, right? Um, I love Anne Lamott's line, if you didn't want me to, to write such things about you, you should have behaved better. <laughs> Um, and mm -hmm. honestly, there's so many memoirists, I don't know how they get away with saying the things they say and either not get sued or like have any family members left who are willing to talk to them. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you think like everything you say is going to be like in the next memoir, you're probably going to keep your mouth shut around that family member. Um, but yeah, but back to like, it is your story. And it's also other people's story who've been through similar things. And to the degree that we can like really tell the truth, go to the line, if not over the line and, and tell it with as much like impact and detail as possible, it can be really destigmatizing and healing for a lot of people in society. Thank you for that. And it looks like there was a comment in the chat um, 
from Vivian about getting permission from anyone also for write it for written material like a letter or an email or a text, which I think is a good reminder. I think that's more of a comment. Um, are there other questions or comments? Sarah? Hi, yes. Hi, Molly. This um what you're describing is one of the highest standards I've ever heard of. So that's really awesome in terms of treating people, you know, in your life. It's really awesome. Um, my question is just like two technical questions uh of your opinion uh do you think people should get permission to list people in acknowledgments i kind of do acknowledgments really casually do you, do you think people will, like are bothered if they're listed i never their... thought about that it's like well i'm saying thank you so hopefully you're not offended that i'm saying thank you that never occurred to me okay and then the other one is did anyone ever say like yeah you can use my story but i want to get paid for it or anything nobody okay thanks you're welcome hi molly hi oh, sorry um hold hey, on one second mimi i think we were is denise um sorry did i freeze mimi can i just ask right you pretty Right, Denise Gray. Yeah. 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 Okay. Hello, hello everyone. Yeah. Hey, Molly. Hey, awesome, Denise. awesome information, and I have to agree. Um, you've given a, a, a certain bar, a very high bar to reach regarding writing a memoir. Um, my question is, how do you go about including the actions of a friend or family member that's passed on in your memoir? That's a really good question. And actually, like my my brother is a perfect example. You know, the circumstances of his death were suspicious. Yeah. There were allegations made against him of child sexual abuse. It was it's and it all happened in the Philippines. So it was three thousand no, six thousand miles away. Um, and then implications for my living family, you know, my parents who mm. have a, were in grief and shame and like so. This might sound a little self-serving, but my theology of the afterlife is that when we pass over, we love and we love as God loves. And we see ourselves, it's like 1 Corinthians 13. Now we see through a glass dimly, then we'll see face to face. We will be known fully, even as we are fully known. And here's the self-serving part. I like to think that those who have passed on beyond the veil, get it they see themselves in their fullness and they mm -hmm. understand the wrongs they've done and they also understand that god loves them and could not love them any better and there's this like union and it's, it's not necessarily instantaneous because when my mom died she had a lot of i write, write about her in the book she had a lot of extreme anxiety and depression it meant that i was really neglected you know suffered neglect abuse as a child not abuse abuse but neglect abuse um and I wrote about her. It's like, I, I would like to think that I have permission from the ancestors to tell okay. their story that they would understand that I'm not doing it to hurt them, but for a greater good. Awesome. Um, just to follow up and piggyback off what you said, what about other relatives when they find out you're writing about a relative that's passed on? Do you uh, give them a heads up? Yes. Do you, okay. I, I sent all my family members the passage about my brother and there's disagreement in my own family about that. So like mm -hmm. talk about threading a needle. It's like, don't shame the family and don't shame Jesse, mm -hmm. but tell the truth, you know, but don't, you don't hear, don't lionize him. Don't, you know, so that was tricky, but ultimately, you know, my dad is 79 and he's been through a lot and I just like while he and my stepmom are alive, I need to protect them a little bit. I got you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thanks, Denise. Great questions. Um, Mimi, did you want to ask a question and come off mute? Yes. Molly? Yeah. This has been just, uh, for me, very helpful. I'm not a pastor. Uh, I've done other things. <laughs> um, I've been a nurse, a hospice nurse. 
And in fact, I still work with uh, medically fragile children who could die. But I also have a gift for writing. And I did a master in theological studies. So I have stuff that I have published, small articles, but also I have a book that's been in the making. So this was all helpful. But my question is, after your first shitty draft to get out your feelings, how many drafts did you do? And on each draft, what was the process? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so my process, and I'll try to fold this in with Jenny's question in the chat too, about um, choosing from a wide field of stories. Um, I mostly what I write are sermons and my sermons usually have a pretty similar structure, right? Cause I've been doing this for 30 years. Yeah. So, and I also like have children and a full-time job. So I needed to write in really intensive short bursts. And what I tended to do was either get up at 4 a.m. <laughs> or go to my friend's, my friend has a lovely cottage um, next to her home in Sonoma. I recommend everyone have a friend with a cottage in Sonoma. I know how privileged and gross that sounds, but I just, she's, she's the pre <laughs> my predecessor at church and actually like we had our own fights and then worked through it. So I feel like that cottage is a little hard one, but back to the matter at hand, I would go there and, and for each day I would write a shitty first draft of one chapter. Um, I framed the whole book at the beginning. Obviously, it was going to be like cancer beginning, middle, end. But then each chapter was going to be kind of its own little, not a sermon, because it had to be more of an essay. Um, it didn't It didn't want to preach. It wanted to like be its own little encapsulated. Like you could read it to, from beginning to end and be like, that was enough. Like I got enough from that out. You know, like you could take things out of order. Um, and each essay had sort of a big theological idea. Um, okay. God doesn't have a plan, but God has a dream, like undermining garbage theology and with, I think, a theology that really is more sensible and humane. Um, and then for each one of those chapters, there would be a little bit of my cancer story and also one or two stories from people that I've pastored or people in my family. Um, so it sounds complex, but I think it works. If you read the book, you can tell me if it worked or not. Um, and now and my process so write the shitty first draft go away from it for like a couple weeks then go back and and start to edit and start to stitch it together with what came before and what came after eventually i send it to a sensitivity reader really wonderful i recommend everybody do this um, mine was a friend who did it for free although i got her a gift card um if you don't know what a sensitivity reader is it's someone who can read um, a manuscript for like, so I'm a white, cis, straight, now upper middle class, not always person. Um, and what are my biases and what am I missing? And what did I say that was frankly ignorant or stupid or hurtful? And she, she would help me find those things um, so I could learn and do better. Um, send it to my editor, then it goes to copy editors and every one of those. So each chapter I probably edited like 10 times at least okay. um, with increasingly fewer edits. That's very helpful. What was the point on the theology? What's the point on the theology? Well, no, I don't mean oh. the purpose, but how did you weave your theology into that's a broad question. I don't even know how to ask the question because you you came out of your sermons correctly? Not really. Um, I did mine a couple sermons. Like there are some sermon excerpts in there, but I, I felt that that would slow things down and be kind of boring to just do like- Right. Of, and sermon anthologies don't sell. <laughs> Let's be honest. Right. Um, but, you know, there were some like, there have been some through lines in, yeah, I've been doing this gig a while and there are some things I believe and I'm open to having my beliefs change, but like there are things that like those, that magpie, those like shiny bits I've collected that I tell people when they're grieving or in distress. Um, and so originally I probably had 20 of those and that was too many chapters. So I winded it down to like six, 15, 16. Um, and just to finish 
Jenny's story. Jenny, so how, to, how do I choose in the field? I just kind of intuitively let stories come to me. It's like, well, okay, I'm talking about God has a plan. God doesn't have a plan, but God has a dream. What does this mean? And whose stories is God going to surface in my memory for me to tell? Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Thank you. Are there other questions? This was a great discussion. I can jump in with a, both a comment and a, and a question. So um, this whole discussion is reminding me my second memoir, my second book is a memoir about our experience as foster parents. And so understandably, there were a lot of sensitive or I had a lot of concerns and sensitivities around the, um, sharing that story. And so did use a synonym. I actually consulted an attorney um, and got the um, adoptive parents permission and they read the manuscript, which they generously gave. So um, so I guess the question for you, Molly, is were, you know, aside from your own kids, were kids sort of, um, I can't remember from the book, right? were, were there kids stories in there and did that add extra complexity for you? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the only kids I referenced were kids who were, who I felt now were grown enough to make their own choice. Like my own kids and a couple of kids from my my last church who are now older teens or young adults. Um, I'm not sure I would like tell a story about a kid because they can't, I mean, I, I asked my kids consent when they were young, but they were my kids. And they're also like, I know them. They're really, they're, they're really like mature. <laughs> they're really like, they're, their preacher's kids are like, they know how to have boundaries and they need boundaries, but I wouldn't do that to another kid because who knows how they're going to feel in 5, 10, 15, 20 years about that, right? That's helpful. Um, Kimberly, do you want to come up here? Yes, so my question is, um, as far as the time effort goes into writing, have you ever had an issue with um, relevancy, like from conception to completion? Is it like, Ooh. okay, this is no longer relevant? Um. Well, I try to write on, you know, broad enough and painful enough things that they're always going to be relevant. Like human pain is always going to come from a few basic sources, right? Um, my editors through various books have flagged things like, oh, you, you know, when I was writing the parenting book, I wanted to reference the, um, what's his, what's his name? Supreme Court Justice. I've blocked his name because I don't want to think about him. Um, and they were like, nope, too topical. I'm like, it's not, or like too, you know, it's it's too like transient. I'm like, this is about sexual assault. It's not transient. Uh oh, there's several uh, you could choose if you're talking. Oh, about oh yeah, exactly. Before. Right. Actually. Um, <laughs> with this one, obviously COVID was the big, you know, the big um, elephant in the room, you know, was the thing we were all going through that was really, really hard. So there are a couple references and obviously like we're not past it. And even in 20 years, we're still gonna be talking about it, but I didn't make it a really central theme for that reason. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just echo that when I was working on my third book, which from Broadleaf, which is the same publisher, it was right as COVID was beginning and they asked me to dial down a lot of the COVID references because of course it was all we could think about or talk about, but you know, that's not the timeless, timeless approach. So um, I will say, I will just add this though. Like sometimes, it, you know, one thing that I've learned through the years is it's okay to push back on your editors. If you feel like they're wrong and you feel like something really needs to be said, like I've, I've, my editor didn't say this, but in the last chapter, which is, um, Dance, dance when you're broken open. I wrote about my neighbor who um, was dancing in the street, which was part of his spiritual practice and like not a busy street. And the neighbors knew him for, he was an African-American man on the autism spectrum. And the cops, someone concerned trolled him and they called the cops on him and they threw him to the ground and broke five of his teeth. And then this whole like little local movement where we all, started showed up dancing in the street for Molly Watkins is his name and this all happened the day before George Floyd died so like locating it there if they had been like well you know like this is what's this going to mean in 20 years this is an evergreen I would have been like yes it's going to be evergreen and it 
damn well should be and we're going to talk about it and this is how we're referencing this so you should you should push back if your instinct says no this is an eternal theme or this is something humans need to remember for a long time thanks for that molly and jenny asked a follow-up question about how you chose your publisher and um whether it was whether you had choice or whether it was the one you got the best response from um i am lucky and blessed to have an agent. Um, I've had, I've been working with from, for my last two books, this book and the parenting book. So um, I write the book proposal with help from her and then she does the shopping with the relationships she has. Um, and we essentially like Broadleaf, we had one good bite before Broadleaf and I'll just lay, show my cards and say, um, it was a publisher I really admire. They're here in San Francisco. They do really fun, fancy stuff. They love my book. And then the money side said, um, tell her to come back when she has 20,000 Instagram followers. And I'm terrible at Instagram. And I was like, Bleh. so we went back to the drawing board and found Bradley Foop and wonderful. And I was like, great. You know, I'm not going to like wait for something better. This is well. That that's actually part of what I wondered. I mean, I have an agent too, but it's like, do you go for the yeah? So that you actually answered the question. Yeah, but, I hate the Instagram thing too. I mean, it's great for people who love it, right? It's and my daughter actually learns a bunch of stuff from Instagram and TikTok. So I'm not like anti-social media. I'm just. It's not me. It's not intuitive to me and me it's exhausting. Thanks, Molly. I love I love this conversation. Um, Ken, do you want to jump in? Yes. Uh, thank you, Molly. I'm a, a retired pastor and 40 years of pastoring. So keep keep at it. You're doing great. Um, <laughs> you just but... consigned me to 10 more years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the rule in in my family that, that was negotiated at the very beginning was the wife and the kids do not appear in the sermons. Uh, and yeah. that was at times very difficult because, of course, those were the best stories. Uh, but I, I followed that. And so I'm I'm now at the place of writing stories. Um, but so this your your uh, your comments have given me a a way to maybe revisit those um, uh, the permissions from family and also the parishioner stories again you know you're confidential you're you're the inside some of those stories that nobody else has that place and uh, it's really tricky when you start to share those people wonder well i wonder what of my stories being shared so uh, i think you're you're trying to um to find a that narrow path there uh, that, that gives me hope. Thank you so much. And God prosper your own writing. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Molly, do you feel, I, have, I feel like with my first book, there was one relationship that really, um, I shared a story, I completely anonymized it. It was very short and I asked for permission and the person was livid, livid. And this was a very close person. And I, you know, it's still hard for me to hold that level of, I mean, it, it was really painful for her, but it was also painful for me to feel that lack of support and the anger, which when, again, I felt like my, uh, in, my intention was really good and loving. Um, yeah. So she gave her permission, but she no, was she still really mad. Oh, she, no, she didn't. Did not. No, she did not. <laughs> so I edited it. And, you know, I think she feels that I responded to her. And so I think we ostensibly, you know, made peace about it. But it really stings still to this day. So I'm just curious if you have any, you know, do you feel like this is, you know, the, the situation's kind of all resolved in a good way? Or do you have some lingering sort of hard, hard stuff around it? Ooh. Hey, you just, whoo, <laughs> you went there. Um, to be honest, so after those, like, or during and after those 50 or 60 conversations, I was, I was emotionally exhausted. I needed so many naps in the midst of that. I did not know how hard that was going to be. 
Um, and then that things kind of, you know, things got like back on the rails and had my author permissions and moved to go to press. And then the next really hard moment was um, when the book came out, I did an East Coast book launch. I'm totally spilling the tea here, but probably no one will, none of my old people will watch this. And even if they are, I love you. I say this all in love. <laughs> I like in my mind, I was there for 12 years. I went through cancer with them. I I baptized their babies. I buried their parents. We went through so much together and I still miss them. I love my new church, people in my heart, and I miss my old people still. And because they went through a bunch of things after I left, they were kind of like, they went from like, oh, our pastor wrote our book, a book about how great we are to like, they went through a lot of the troubles and they're still kind of digging themselves out of that. They had a really difficult next relationship with their next pastor that I won't get into. And like, no one is, no one's at fault, but ministry's hard, <laughs> church is hard. Um, and they weren't ready for me to, tell a bunch of like triumph stories about them. Um, and I didn't realize that. And I was not in, nor I did not have like, communication was not normalized with them because they have to initiate that in my, like I have really strong boundaries around, you know, coming back to a parish you've left and they haven't invited me back yet. So like in my brain, they're, I'm like, this is the perfect opportunity. Maybe they'll call me up and like, want me to do the book launch at church. And that'll be like a great homecoming and be like, remember when, but it'll, enough time will be, have gone by that we're all healed and we're happy together. And not only did they not make that offer, it got very uncomfortable when I told the, their new pastor, who's wonderful about the book and invited them to the book launch, which is gonna be at a local bookstore couple miles away and some of them came and they were so it was so sweet but it wasn't this like triumphal party that I was hoping for in celebration and I was really hurt like I I talked about it in therapy a lot <laughs> with my spiritual director because it was not the story I'd written in my head it was not the happy ending for like me and my church and like I left them but now we're back together and we've grown so much and isn't that great um, so I guess the takeaway there is just be ready for anything, be ready for ruptures, do your best to keep your side of the street clean and understand that like when people are mad at you, it's really not, I mean, some of it might be about you and you should examine it for that, but a lot of it's just about what, what they're going through and their grief and yeah. distress yeah. and yeah. vulnerability, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. Wow. Um, well, there's one more question in the chat. I know we're at the hour, but um, I, I, I just like this because Carrie asked about um, pen names, which I assume she means for you, but also biographical fiction. And I will say, and actually there's an author, a friend of mine who decided to turn, who started a memoir, but then turned it into a novel and went through a lot of the same things where she had to get her family's permission and change a lot of details. But did you ever consider that, Molly, or have you ever thought about writing fiction? I didn't. And I don't because I'm not a good fiction writer. And that's just the truth. Like I'm a journalist who can embellish and prune stories and I stay in my lane, but I'm <laughs> terrible at fiction. Not terrible. Like I write like, you know, embroidered biblical storytelling things, but I, I need something to start with. I, I'm not a person who can come up with something ex nihilo or even like take a bunch of this stuff and fictionalize it enough to make it a novel. It would just be like lumpy and awkward. I know myself. Great. Well, are there any other burning questions folks have? Yeah, I have one. Okay, go ahead. Amy. It's just real quick. Molly, how did you find your agent? Dumb luck. Uh, a friend of mine was writing, who's also UCC pastor, was writing young adult fiction. He, she was his agent. She was kind enough to read um, our manuscript. She loved it. She's raising three young children. It was the parenting book. She's like, this is a pain pill. I need this. I'm going to work on this. And she's been awesome. I know not everyone's happy with an agent. Mine is awesome and has worked so hard for me. And I'm really, really grateful to her. And is also like, as I said, a big truth teller has made all my, both my books a lot better. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Well, this has been such an informative um, and rich discussion. I want to thank all of you for the questions and comments you made. And again, um, here's Molly's wonderful book, How to Begin When the when your world is ending a spiritual field guide to joy despite everything. So Molly, thank you for your words and also for just answering our questions and sharing so vulnerably your process, um, really informative and helpful. So thank, thank you all for you. being here. This was such yeah. a fun and easy conversation. You asked so many awesome questions and I'm gonna make a shameless plug. If you buy it from Amazon, will you please review it on Amazon because those really help other people find the book. And also Molly, can you tell us your website and so we can learn more about you in general? Yeah, it's mollybasket.com. Super easy, B-A-S-K-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. And I have an author Great. newsletter you can subscribe to. It's not super spammy. I send it out like once a month. Wonderful. Well, thank you again Thanks and blessing to everyone in your writing and Molly and you and your continued book launching um, and pastoring. Thanks, and um, this recording will be available online so you can share it with your colleagues and friends as well. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.